much everyone for coming. Um, I'm just so happy that we have a lot of authors here uh, to celebrate uh, Bamboo Ridge's uh, 40th years, um, the 40th anniversary. So we have um, some authors who are going to um, be reading um, their works um, at Leeward Community College. And uh, first up is Amalia B. Bueno. Her poems and stories have been published in various local, national, and international journals and anthologies. Her chapbook, Home Rem Remedies, was published by Finishing Line Press in 2015. She's pursuing a PhD in English and teaches composition and creative writing at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Her research interests include uh, Philippinex, poetry, creative writing, pedagogy, and Asian American literature. Thank you, Amalia. Aloha. Kamusta kayo amin apo? How's it like that? So I have a story in this book. It's the first time I'm seeing it. Let me just read the first paragraph because it's a long story. And then I can read the last paragraph. And then you have to buy the book to like figure out what's in the middle. It's called The Curse. It is believed that a curse among Filipino families takes on a life of its own. The necklace was cursed. Or so per the Perlita Peralta clan gossiped once upon a time. And even now, many moons since the gold in the ancient necklace was forged in the Cordillera Mountains, the necklace still haunted the family. And every time there was an unexpected mysterious illness, they believed the wayward necklace caused it. An unexplained death, the necklace did it. A physical deformity in a newborn, from a hair lip to a soft carabao horn protrusions at the temples in some second or third cousin, did they blame genetics? No, they invoked the necklace. Um, I'll just read the last paragraph. Kathy looked forward to string the necklace together to adorn her grandmother's neck. It was only a necklace after all, a talisman meant to bring families together if they fell apart. Okay, um, I feel most comfortable in poetry, so I'm going to read from my chapbook. It's called Home Remedies. And I'll start with um, moth greeting. Did you ever see like a moth? And you're like, auntie, is that you, grandma? So this is called moth greeting. <coughs> a huge gray moth came calling at the window screen. And I guess it was supposed to be you because my temple skipped a pulse and my chest got all warm. I never know how far to invoke the Babailan and her mystic. Should I mouth my greetings, update my absolutions, or whether I should smile polite, smile sincere, smile nervous, or just have simple faith that it is your spirit inside that furry body. So instead, I just nod quiet, sit still, pay homage to every single dead relative I can remember, just in case, indeed, all of you are there, distilled sentinels watching me and testing my manners. <laughs> I have this friend who's like a real princess, but she's like from Kauai, but she's, so she's like really tera. So I wrote this poem, and I denied it when she said, is this about me? I said, no, it's about the, the tera princess. Don't bother the tera princess who lives in Jacqueline. She's doing her nails and thinking about what to wear tomorrow. If she sees you watching, she will belch at you. Then she'll say, excuse me, this is what happens when I drink soda. Then she'll burp loudly again because she does. So you must say, that's an interesting color you have on your fingers and toes. Then she'll say, it's called mauve. It matches the green and purple pantsuit I'm wearing tomorrow at breakfast. Then at breakfast, she'll ask you, did you notice how color coordinated I am? She'll turn her palms up and spin once around on her heels. She will smile at you sweetly. The Tita Princess is lots of fun, but she is spoiled, spoiled, spoiled. 
she used to drive a cherry apple red BMW convertible. Now she drives a dark green Honda with polished walnut interior that she details every month because, as she says, she wants the valet to have a pleasant experience. So I write a lot about um, women and culture. And um, <clears throat> when I did my master's thesis, it was like 80 pages of poems. And I was coming up with, what shall I call it? And I was reading about Gabriela Silang, who is um, a revolutionary. Her husband, Diego Silang, was a general. And when he got um, assassinated and ambushed by one of his men, she took over. And supposedly, she was really mean. And so they called her the Generala, the general. And so this is for her, Gabriela, Gabriela Silang. It's called Gabriela's Daughters. <clears throat> you are the fire in us, the dark streak that runs through us. You are the poem in us, passed on for our namesake, Gabriela. You are the Gubet Gurelia in us, that resurrects the insurrectionist in us. You're the island in us, your extraordinary dazzling daughters in us. Your hips, your book of light, passing through, passing down, flowing low for us and for us to keep. Keep the stories, keep time, keep us. How much time do I have left? Okay. I'll read um, the title story or the title poem, Home Remedies. Um, I used to work with um, female offenders in the women's prison, and then I also taught creative writing when they were in transitional housing. And, <coughs> excuse me, this is called Home Remedies. Peel and slice a few coins from this ginger root. Bite through to steady your motion sickness. Smash each tear of this head of garlic. Salt and smear the paste to cover your purple flower bruises. From the sweet onion plant, scrape the white flowers into a crucible. Sprinkle in two dried bitter melon leaves, three drops of tea tree oil. Pulverize with a pestle and then rub gently on your cuts to transform them into scars. Pluck the ampalaya leaves to concoct a home brewed tea. Leave the bitter drink for him. Take a look around to see what you are leaving. Shut the door behind you and lock yourself up. Thank you. Okay, the next reader is Wing Tak Lam. He is a Honolulu businessman and poet. Wei and Apao. Bamboo Ridge Press has published his two collections of poetry, Expounding the Doubtful Points and the Nanjing Massacre Poems. He's a recipient of the Cades Award for Literature. Wayne Tekla. I'm going to read five poems from my Chinatown series, Imagining Lives of Chinese Immigrants in Hawaii at the Turn of the Last Century. One of the enterprises that the early Pake were involved in was the manufacturing of poi, that is taking taro grown by farmers, transforming it into poi and marketing it to consumers. My poem is based on the biography of Chung Kong Yu, who lived in KNI on Maui 100 plus years ago. It's entitled Poi Factory. Our family worked in shifts and took on different chores Eldest sister and I woke up before dawn to prepare the day's meals for everyone. I also collected the kiawe from the shed and the water we needed for the steamer. My father and mother knew several languages spoken in our neighborhood and greeted the farmers who arrived throughout the day. They came with their mule carts loaded with heavy burlap bags full of taro. We scrubbed off the mud and fibers and placed the corms on wooden racks in our oven. 
Younger brother and younger sister were responsible for tending to the coal fire, making sure the pan of water was kept boiling, but also did not evaporate out, and wetting down the canvas draped over the oven. The corms which had been steamed from the day before were gathered up by my uncle and elder brothers. They peeled off the poisonous skin and with stone hammers pounded the taro. Some liked to buy just the mash. For others, we needed in water to sell as paste. All of us helped pack the poi into small, smaller cloth bags weighing five pounds each. These were picked up by peddlers who then spread out on chosen routes to call on households across our valley. Sometimes some of us took breaks, especially to eat a midday snack, though not all of us at the same time. Whenever one task needed more hands, there were enough of us who dropped our own work to help out. Only when the sun was setting did we all sit down together for dinner, and then immediately after we went to bed except for our parents, who stayed up by the kerosene lamp to settle the accounts and plan for the next day, which turned out to be the same as every day, year in and year out, until I married. Many of the old Pake were concerned about the politics of their home country, which was then ruled by the Manchus. Sun Yat-sen and others came to Hawaii to seek support especially financial assistance, to continue, to continue their efforts to overthrow what they considered to be barbarian oppressors. The problem was that while in Hawaii, these revolutionaries needed to be discreet since the Chinese government representatives were monitoring their activities here. This is entitled, Dusk Descends. Dusk descends, long thick shadows give way to pitch black alleys and back courtyards. Eyes see only the incandescent glow of lamplights as the revolutionary slips through a hidden door out onto the muffled cobblestone streets. A mother sings a lullaby. The foul odor of vomit wafts over the lane behind the bar. From a second story window, an abacus clacks unabated. With a nod, a burly man in a derby hat whisks him away to a vestibule with mirrors past cast iron gratings through a one-way passage with a secret name. Thin sticks of incense smolder at the altar, an offering for souls ever valiant, their scent of sandalwood swirling through the basement, rough-hewn from blue rock. A hush gathers. Men with coiled braids and grim smiles hang on his every word, longing to believe, longing for him to proclaim that our homeland will yet be set free. My next poem is about a young man who lives in the mountains and is written from the point of view of a visitor um, who drops, out, uh, drops by out of the blue. This is called The Kite. I drop out, uh, I'm sorry, I'm gonna start again. I drop by out of the blue. Today, for some reason, he has decided to make a kite from the thin stakes he has hoarded, sheets of old newspaper, some fat grains of sticky rice to turn into glue and a ball of twine. He has shaped the wood into a diamond, twined fast at the four corners, and pasted layers of newspaper to cover the frame. This is when I show up in his shed, and I laugh out loud at this sight. He is about to leave to try out his creation. Had I arrived a short time later, I would have missed him. I clap my hands in anticipation. We walk down to the pasture with me carrying the kite while he leads the way. His steps are light. I hum a tune about planting taro. When we reach the clearing, the sun is at its zenith, but hidden behind an overcast sky. We are ready, and I hold up the kite, letting it go with a shout as he yanks at the twine, running like hell, his long pigtail trailing. There is a breeze, but the kite never catches hold and hits the ground soon enough. We try again a few times more from different spots where the wind might gather, but it does not fly. The frame quick quickly collapses. I pick it up, and it comes to me that it is too heavy. 
I tell him so. Carefully, he collects all the broken stakes, the newspaper torn apart, and we climb back to his home, subdued, talking about everything and anything but what he holds in his hands. He opens his door. He has no windows, light only entering through this one opening. I say goodbye. I do not look inside. He has a crush on me, but I never visit again. Some of the bachelors were able to marry either by sponsoring wives to come over from China or by marrying native Hawaiians. Then they were able to start families here and we are the progeny of these fortunate few. This next poem is about one such family. It's entitled Holiday. We set out early that after that we set out early that morning. The mustard cabbage we had harvested, we sold to one store quickly so that we could enjoy the town for the rest of the day. It had been a few years since we had had the time to do so, and the streets had changed so much. There was a new theater, new coffee shops and bakeries, so many people dressed differently, speaking different dialects or different languages. My wife marveled at how each store displayed its sacks of poi for us to taste, freshly made, one day old, or two, from, grown from different parts of the island. Our boy stuck his fingers in so many samples that he lost his appetite for lunch. At the general stores, we shopped for hard soap and a kerosene lamp to replace the old one I could not fix, duck liver, liver sausages and dried shrimp, a wooden blanket, some cloth for new pants for our growing boy, and my favorite whiskey. We paid our respects to my elder cousin, now bedridden in his room. He talked to us only about wanting more to smoke to take away his pain. Instead, we left him eggs still warm, taken from our chickens that morning. In the park, a band was playing, the music loud and blaring. Our boy sat atop my shoulders to see above the crowd, but then my wife complained that she also was too short. So I put him down on, and got on all fours to invite her to stand on me, which she did, and which made our boy fall over laughing at us. We ate our early dinner at the clubhouse, devouring a fat mullet which we had bought from the pier. But we also had to listen to old men arguing about the politics back home. The three of us shared a soda pop, giggling as the bubbles tickled our noses. We walked back, reaching our farm before the sun had set. My wife is now dead. Our boy and his young family have moved into town, and he walks past those very same streets. But I wonder if he remembers that special time long ago when there was just the three of us strolling about the hustle and bustle in awe of that other world. It is a memory that I still hold close to me, one suspended in time like a translucent rock we saw, exhibited at City Hall that afternoon, the size of our boy's fist with a small dark incense encased inside, surrounded by the sweetest honey. I'll read one more poem, um, which describes another old timer who has retired to live in the mountains. It's entitled, Within the Dragon's Breath, When I first arrived inside the heart of the valley, the morning mist still enshrouded the mountaintops, their fluted cliffs, a dance of sunlight and shadows surrounding our patchwork of jade green farms like a tomb. Years of taro and mud indeed drained my life force, a lotus once blossoming as an unquenchable fire. I retreated up to the ridge line, my clothes ragged, the small of my back a skein of knots and woes. Now I huddle in my hut beneath a stand of sandalwood. At dawn, I awaken to birds calling out to their mates. I am everywhere engulfed by clouds, and in the dim light, all my senses are alert. At these times, the only thing that matters is the present, within the dragon's breath, billowing, unfurling, sometimes damp and dense, sometimes effervescent, and then in a flash, this fog is gone. Instead, below my eyes follow the far river as it spills out, like many arms of a lover outstretched, into the sea, 
into the hard blue of the horizon and inexorably to the land of our ancestors beyond. Thank you. Um, many of you may know Professor Inoshita, who is a very prim and proper uh, teacher here, but also probably very strict. You may not know that she is uh, born and raised in Oahu. She's written a book of poetry uh, called Manoa Stream, and she's co-authored No Choice But to Follow and What We Must Remember with three other poets published by Bamboo Ridge. Her short play, Where I Stay, a play in Hawaii, was included in the state Hood Project performed by Kumu Kuhua Theater and published by Fat Ulua Publications. Her creative works have been anthologized widely in local and international journals. And she's also working on another book of poems, which uh, hopefully will be published very soon and will show her zanier side. All right, um, I just wanted to read three poems from uh, this Bamboo Ridge 40th anniversary issue, and they're all in, in pigeon. <laughs> the first one is called, I Stay on the Phone. <laughs> Sometimes, me and my sister, playing when our mother talk on the phone, we make big noise, and our mother cover the phone with her hand and say, <laughs> and say I stay on the phone. <laughs> then she talk into the phone and say stuff like, I'm sorry, could you repeat that again? Thank you. She take the pen by the end table and write down notes on one paper pad. After that, she hang up and tell us, you guys, you know, I on the phone. No fool around, hard for here, you know. I ask my mother, why you talk like that on the phone? Sound fake. She explained to me, sometimes you gotta talk like that when you talk to people. I never understand. I must look confused because my mother tell me, you go and see. Later, when you walk or gotta do errands, you gonna talk to all kind people. Most of them gonna talk like how I talk on the phone. That's how. I watch my mom pay bills. Boring. <laughs> so me and my sister think of one not a game for play. Uh, the next poem is called Plates Are for Food. After my bachan passed away, we still get her singer sewing machine. Gotta press down the metal plate with your foot each time you like so. We get the washboard that she used to <laughs> that she used for hand wash clothes, and we get the wood safe with the screen door for store food. We use the big metal pot with handmade metal wire hanger a handle. Whenever my mother make turkey soup, cause no can find big pots like that anymore. We use the plate stamped with made in occupied Japan in red letters on the other side of the plate. I hold the plate in my hand and sound like Indiana Jones when I tell my mother, this belongs in one museum. <laughs> my mother no answer and she grab one bottle tsukemono from the fridge. For dinner, I put rice, tonkatsu, and tsukemono on the plate and I eat cause plates are for food. Um, now, you can envision, like, because, well, I'm a Waipahu girl, but um, back in the day, <laughs> envision the 70s <laughs> and before then. Um, why, there's this uh, poem I created called Waipahu Get Everything You Need. For grocery shopping, get dye and times. Get fabric for make clothes at Cornet and sembe at Ishihawaraya. Need one new fridge? Go Midtown Radio. I bought my first Hawaiian ring from Arakawa's. Whenever I had field trip, my mother ordered bentos from Hamada's Okazuya. Sato's Okazuya get ono fried noodle with barbecue stick. Everybody know Highway Inn and Taniokas. Before time, my mother used to work Tawata Simon Stan. I thought the place was like when Simon Stan in the Japanese movies. Turns out, was one regular eating place in one building. She used to make vanilla Cokes and any kind soda as well, going business school. My bachan was one fry cook at Country Inn. Every time she asked my mother what she like eat before she left work, my mother always say cheeseburger and fries. My jichan was on machinist for the plantation, and my father was an installer repairman for Hawaiian Tell. 
Only my mother work in town as a bookkeeper. Waipahu get everything you need, except when you got to go Cinerama Theater to watch Star Wars. Thank you. Um, I want to introduce, um, a lot of you know him. Um, his um, students are here as well. Uh, Donald Carrera Ching was born and raised in Kahalu'u and graduated with his MA in Creative Writing from UH Manoa. His short stories and poetry have appeared in local, national, and international publications. His debut novel, Between Sky and Sea, A Family Struggle, was published in December 2015 by Bamboo Ridge Press. He is currently working on his second novel, Who You Know, and a collection of short stories. He is recipient of the Cades Award for Literature. Welcome, Donald Carrera Ching. Is that okay? Yeah, like that? Okay, so? Maybe a little bit higher. Hello? Yeah? Okay. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I was going to read uh, my selection that's published in uh, Bamboo Ridge number 113, but it's a selection from the novel I'm currently working on, and I felt like to kind of read a section of that it's sort of like reading a section within a section, sort of within something that you know you really have no kind of understanding of. And although I think it's the first chapter and that would be okay, I thought um, instead of reading that, which um, I'd read something kind of similar. Um, with a lot of my writing, I like to uh, use use it as a way to kind of grapple with social issues and grapple with the things that are going on in my community as well as the communities that kind of surround us, and especially here in Hawaii. And in that particular story, it deals with the social pressures that oftentimes faith, face youth, um, especially, uh, or particularly teen youth. And so in the story I'm gonna read, which is a little bit different, um, it doesn't focus on that, but it does grapple with something I think is uh, very relevant to all of us, and I imagine it's a, it's a kind of a shared experience. And it's something that I didn't quite kind of take in when it happened, uh, but uh, in the summer, uh, my wife and I went to an event and um, a play that was put on called 38 Minutes. And it tackled the, uh, well, you're going to see what it tackled. But it inspired me essentially to write this piece. And so I'd like to read it today. It's, and it's a full piece, so I think that's what's kind of nice about it. Okay. And it's called False Alarm. Before I could answer you, the jets circled back. Another drill, their engines tearing open the sky above us reminding everyone below of the base only a few nautical miles across the bay. Of course, it reminded me of something else too, the first time that you asked me that question, just after we got the alert. January 13th, 8.07 a.m., emergency alert, ballistic missile threat inbound to Hawaii, seek immediate shelter, this is not a drill. Wake up, you shook me. You didn't give me an option pulling off the blankets and pushing me off the bed with your feet. The dogs were circling the room, barking at your frenzy. I murmured, a, um, I murmured a response, something like, what's wrong with you? And then you pushed a screen in my face. I squinted to read it aloud and then got, got up to grab my glasses. I read it again. What do we do? I asked, all of the articles I had scrolled through on Facebook suddenly forgotten. You didn't bother to answer. You grabbed both of the dogs in your arms and walked out into the hallway, deducing our survival strategy based on the layout of our one-bedroom home. Everywhere has windows, you commented. So? I was missing something. So maybe the center of the house is better, the living room. You dropped both dogs and started to close doors, jealousies, moving around the house. I followed after you, still trying to make sense of what was going on. It's probably just a mistake. And if it's not, I don't know, I was honest. You continued with your logic moving into the kitchen to fill water bottles and assess the lack of canned goods in the cupboard. We're gonna die, you said. I wanted to be helpful, so I googled data on nuclear bombs and fallout. I started filling in blanks on nuke map. After I hit detonate, I relayed the data to you. I think it's gonna be okay, I said, not realizing how shaky my voice was. You stopped what you were doing and sat next to me. How long do you think we have? I don't know. You replied. One of the dogs came up on the couch and nuzzled into your bare leg. You pet him like you weren't counting the minutes, but I knew you better than that. Still, I sat there and stared at the open windows on my screen, 
Your phone rang, making both of us jump. The dog started barking again. You answered, and I quieted them down. It was your father. You asked him if he was okay and put him on speakerphone. I'm just waiting for it, he said. You need to get inside, Dad. Where's Mom? Sleeping, he said. You were stunned. I looked around, still not really sure what to do. There isn't a chance, he asserted. And if anyone would know, it would be him, a Vietnam veteran, a survival of the Cold War. He had seen friends splintered by bombs and bullets. He knew that shrinking under a, de a desk wouldn't save anyone. So did you, but you disagreed anyway. Even a realist know that knows that there's always a chance. Inside, Dad, just go inside. You didn't hang up until you were sure he had listened. What now? You asked me. I thought about the people I should call and everything that we should have done to prepare, but we didn't and we hadn't. So I just tried to focus on the curtains that you had pulled closed and the light that was still visible through them. I waited for the air to blister, knowing too many minutes had been wasted. January 13th, 8.45 a.m. There is no missile threat or danger in the state of Hawaii. Repeat, false alarm. The jets passed again. It had been over six months since that day. Nothing had really changed except our level of anxiety and our awareness of every alert, flash flood, or otherwise. We talked more about the military, military convoys on the freeway, which was nothing new, but still made us wary, and the plans that we knew we should, should make, but didn't. The news would sometimes shake us with its coverage of Trump and North Korea, and its headlines meant to make us click in alarm, but there was always yoga, Netflix, or an unexpected bill. NPR would quote Oppenheimer, and I would plug in the auxiliary cord and turn the music on. What now? You asked again like you had that day, and I thought about all the decisions I hadn't made, the things I hadn't done, and how many times I had failed you. And then I laughed at another thought, realizing that the end of the world had been imminent, and neither of us had bothered to say goodbye. We'll get through this, I finally said, sure that we'd survive. Thank you so much. So what we're going to do is uh, we're going to change the setup a little bit uh, because we want to have some question and answers uh, from you in regards to anything, the writing process, whatever questions you had while you were listening to all of these uh, wonderful writers. OK, so we'll, we'll just kind of um, take a short break. Thank you. At this time, if everybody, anybody has questions, uh, especially if you're here for a class, uh, it's a good time to ask questions. Okay, and that's what I tell my students, so let's see. I was just, um, I teach an intro to creative writing class and we're doing poetry, and the cliches just come on, you know, like, raining cats and dogs, um, love, especially with love. Mm -hmm. um, I try to say, pair it with something that's um, discordant, meaning that doesn't match. Um, and sometimes changing the syntax will do. Like instead of salty blue ocean, you could say like salt ocean, salt tears. Um, everybody knows what salty tears are and salty oceans are, but if you kind of reverse some syntax, it works. But my advice is um, think of something that's opposite of what it is and sometimes it works sometimes it doesn't you know it was raining just dogs not cats um that might um conjure an image in the river that it wasn't raining that hard although you've turned that cliche on its head um i think what i would also recommend too is uh 
you know, we rely on cliches oftentimes because, you know, they're so kind of prevalent in our society and because we want them to sort of imbue an emotion that they already have. So I would also probably say that, you know, look at that cliche and what you're trying to say with it and kind of unpack it and figure out what is it exactly you're trying to communicate with that. And then, so that's one, I think one part. And the second part, you know, kind of staying true to yourself and your kind of original experience and your original detail and then try to take that feeling or whatever you're trying to communicate and do it in a way that's kind of true to your experience in a different way. Um, so that you can kind of eliminate the cliche because cliches aren't necessarily, you know, I, I think they're bad because we've heard them so much so that, you know, um, they become something we rely on. And because of that, we assume that the reader is going to understand what we're trying to communicate. And so by kind of breaking it down for us and then reassembling it with our own original detail, um, we can kind of get closer to, I think, where we want to go uh, with our writing. Certainly. Thank you, Bill, for Thank the you. question. I guess for, for me, like, to, to me, like, you can always, I mean, to me, there's, there's never too much, you know, in terms of the planning, you know, but I, I think it's a writer's choice on how much they reveal, right, to the audience, because um, as, like, you're kind of, like, in this godlike <laughs> situation as a writer, you, it's your own world that you create, um, but the audience, you can choose which facts and which um, experiences um, you can flesh out that the audience will, will know later on you know so in my mind the whatever thank you uh, whatever planning you do you know that that's fine I don't think you can over plan but I think the the challenge is to tell too much too early in the story to, to the reader you know when you can actually withheld um, a lot of information until you have that great scene or that the, the, the actual timing where the reader needs to know that fact, that's when you should reveal it, you know? So kind of choose wisely when you want to have that information um, uh, known to your reader. Yeah. Okay, yes, Andrea. Yeah. Sometimes um, I get really excited about the start of a poem and I uh, think I have a lot of ideas, and then I run out of gas very quickly. At other times, um, it doesn't look promising, but I persevere, and then I persevere, and I persevere, and somehow, somehow uh, something happens, an image comes up that pops into my mind, and suddenly it turns the poem around so that it's actually worthwhile to continue. Um, so I don't really know how to answer your question except to say you have to be able to be waiting properly, be humble and be waiting properly so that uh, you're not just sitting around twiddling your thumbs, uh, but you're thinking about a piece that maybe you've, you've started and you're, you're, you, you, you've got some more ideas about. So you wait and you get another idea. Uh, um, on, on the other hand, you also cannot just continue to work something to death either. So it's, that's, there's a balance there. And I don't have a formula for you to, to share with you about that. I think every, every new poem is a challenge. But I think you have to just be ready and waiting. Any, any further questions or any, any last question? Oh, oh, yes. Oh, oh, good. We can have, like, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, oh. child I always was kind of um, scribbling and writing things down and I think part of it was being around family and thinking gosh they're saying such interesting things I don't even know what it means but I'll write it down and then I started to keep a journal until I was maybe 
ninth grade because I discovered other things in high school. Um, and when I went to college, um, I had to write a paper and I decided that I was going to try to write a poem instead. And so I asked my professor, um, can I write a poem like in addition to the paper? And if the poem is okay, can you substitute it for the paper? And so he encouraged me. And I look at that poem now and I'm like, oh God, it's so awful. Like you said, it's overwrought, it gives too much. But I think um, that's when I thought, okay, maybe there's this tiny light that I'm a poet. And then um, my first published piece was actually not a poem, but a story by Bamboo Ridge. And it was because the Titta Princess and I went to a chicken fight. And she's like, you gotta come here, you gotta check this out. I'm like, where are you? I'm in Wailu at a chicken fight, come. And I'm like, oh my God, what is doing there? You're a princess. <laughs> anyway, to make a long story short, we went and I started to write a story um, called The Chicharon Widows. And if you've ever been in a chicken fight, it's like a carnival and there's like food and children running around and card games and all that. And there was a food stand and they were selling chicharon and vegetables. And I just kind of started writing and writing and um, I don't know, nobody encouraged me. I think, oh, Bamboo Rich has a deadline coming up. I think I'll submit it. And so I did and, you know, it was published and it was like, since I was a new writer, what do you guys call those things? New writer award or best fiction, whatever. And that was when I thought I was a real writer because I got paid for it too. Um, my experience or background is completely different from Amalia's. Um, I uh, was really good in math and science when I was a kid in, in elementary school and high school. And uh, the only thing I remember about English class was the, 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 when the teacher discussed poetry, it was like a, solving a math problem of, you know, how to explain why this word was used here and how it relates to something else at the bottom of the poem or something like that. So it was completely different than uh, just being a lover of literature. However, in college around your age, I uh, encountered some, shall we say, um, unfortunate uh, interpersonal relationships. <laughs> and so I then uh, decided I'd try to write about them and um, it turned out to be poems which were god awful. <laughs> um, but uh, I persevered and um, wrote other poems, even though I was in college majoring in engineering. So I was, I was doing all sorts of math and science things, but as a hobby, I um, decided I'd uh, use poetry as, as sort of this, uh, this other escape. And so I kept writing, and uh, sometimes I shared them with others, and they said, oh, these are pretty, pretty good. So I kept writing and kept writing, and that's how I'm still a writer. Thanks. Yeah. Well, um, uh, there were like two, two more questions. Yeah. Sorry, I hate microphones. Um, well, I think, and to maybe to answer some of the other questions that were kind of going on, I think probably, you know, in, in the sense of, the, the, you know, when do you become a writer, I think you're always a writer. If you're writing, you're a writer. Um, and, you know, if you send out something and it doesn't get published, you know, keep sending it out and keep writing and, and it will get published. Um, and so, and I, and I think that would, that, that kind of advice of keep writing also applies to your short story problem, where in the sense you can kind of sit at the desk and you can look at that story, that blank line, wherever you stopped, and you can feel the pressure and the stress to think of where am I gonna go next. And I mean, from personal experience, sometimes when I'm having that, that problem, I'll, I might take a break, and I might sort of go take a shower or eat something and, and be thinking about it. Um, but sometimes it doesn't work. And so it's just, let me just throw 
whatever will you know whatever on the page and, and see and, and you know see if I can get to the, maybe the next paragraph or see if I can get to the next section or see if I can get to the end of the page um, because the nice thing about writing is you know you might have 12 pages of, of nonsense at the end of the day but where the real sort of work comes into play after you've done that is then taking that and, and shaping it down um, because you might get to the end you might start chronologically from you know the moment it happens to the, the end and then you realize well the story is actually just these two pages um, but you need kind of the junk before you can get to those, those essentially those two pages um, so I would say just keep writing with it and then the other thing is I would spend time if you haven't done it already be thinking you know chart it be like okay what's the first event what's the second event what's kind of the third one and all the, the sequence of events that are there the main events you might have the middle ones you know kind of in between and then think about okay well, where is my story starting in this and then okay what of these events are important and then you can possibly begin to think about kind of where you're going in that way but you've got to I mean you have to do the work I think in that, in that particular respect and I think we had a one last question somewhere yes <laughs> I, I guess what well, well like for me um, I mean it's easy to the, the, when I find myself overthinking um, that's when I, I need to take that break that you know people were talking about just because like say like in, in my realm I guess poetry when I notice I start like like second guessing myself and I start like crossing things out and I'm like no 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 wait wait I should have kept it and, and I, I kind of go nuts <laughs> for a little while then I'm like that's kind of dangerous right because you're kind of a little too much, you know, like into your head and all of that. So usually, um, basically what, what Don, Don was saying earlier, just taking that break so that you're in that right mindset so that you don't subtract too much or add too much, you know, like so maybe like, you know, just take a little break, like take a nap or, you know, and then you'll, you'll kind of have a better judgment as to, and, and kind of like follow your instincts. Because um, I notice a lot of times your characters will speak to you and they'll do, do things or not do things based on who these characters are. So when you find yourself kind of in a rut where you're trying to force your character to do something, to do something but it's not right, there's probably a really deep down good reason why it's getting hard. And it's probably based on who your, who your character is and it might not really match with where you want the plot to go. So whenever you're in that kind of a conflict like that, I would listen to the character because the character will kind of show you what direction they would go. Yeah. So. Okay. And then sometimes, at least for me, you run out of gas, and that's <laughs> it. And you don't know what else to do, and you say, okay, pow, that's it. Yeah. I want to um, address uh, your question about short story. Um, in my experience teaching um, short story, I find that if you have your conflict down, and if you think of conflict, it's really in the middle. So I tell students, try starting in the middle if you can't start. Um, who wants what and why can't they get it? Who's stopping them? Why do they want it? Um, is it a true thing that they want or something false that's an illusion in their head. Um, so I think conflict is really important, not only because it gives you direction in the story, but people want to read about love lost or, you know, things misunderstood. I mean, at least I do. Um, so if, if you're stuck, start in the middle, and then you'll see if you need, if, if you have your middle solid in terms of conflict and your protagonist, you'll see what they need before then and what's going to happen after. Um, with regard to poetry, I am the worst at nitpicking. Um, I probably like spent so many hours and then pretty much have the same version I started with and that's really true what Anne said about you start second guessing yourself. So like when you feel frustrated, put it away, you know, put it away in the drawer, um, go to the beach, come back. I swear you can like have a different perspective on what that poem could be or what you wanted it to be, but like what the poem itself wanted to be instead. That's true. That's true. All right. 
Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, good questions. And um, thank you so much for everyone for coming. Yeah, appreciate it. And all of you for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.